Okay, I'm all excited. People are signing in. Hello to all. Hello everybody. Hi. I am, I am Manisha here, Akhil's mom. We have uh, Emily. We have uh, Mita. Mita, can you say hi? This is Mita, the program coordinator. Everyone. And we all are excited about this. We have been talking about this. It's so good to see you all. Thank you, everybody, for um, listening to the webinar. I hope you all have enjoyed it. You must have got so many emails from us constantly. And I think, uh, Emily, I want to tell you that 150 people have already listened to your webinar. And I'm today we have questions from almost uh, 100 people, I guess. 100 people have filled up the form and put the questions. That's great. I'm here. I'm here to uh, start whenever you want me to start. And I'm here to answer your questions. And uh, we might even get up and do a few exercises today, too. But I do ask you to each have some water with you. So I just want to quickly introduce myself. I would appreciate if everybody, you all just mute yourself and uh, um, let, the video, let the video be off so you can have a good um, uh, there, there will be no network issues. Uh, very quickly, I am Akhil's mom. I'm just introducing myself. I'm Akhil's mom. Our son Akhil is 19 years old and he is recovering from autism. We, he was diagnosed at 18 months. We were not given any hope. He was completely non-verbal. And now at the age of 19, uh, his language is coming. I have so many of his videos available on, on our YouTube channel. I'm a holistic health coach now. I've put my entire IT career running the foundation from almost, I think, 12 years now. Uh, me and my husband, we started this. And our Akhil is uh, preparing for college education. So all the resources we have, we were not given any hope. Forget about recovery. Forget about, uh, he did not know his letters, numbers till age of, 12 and now he has done algebra geometry learning trigonometry so there is a lot of hope and this is the reason why we have started the foundation um, we bring in education treatment resource uh, research we collaborated with Rutgers University and our goal today right now is to bring in a lot of um, novel uh, evidence-based treatments and educate parents and professionals so I'm excited about today's Brain Gym. We had a successful uh, five uh, sessions, Brain Gym online class with the kids. This is the whole thing. We want kids to come online and participate. And that's the reason we are making this free recorded webinars available free. We would <laughs> like to bring in such more webinars and some more question and answers. This is a platform. So Emily, without any further uh, thing, I would like you to please introduce yourself and we'll take it from there. Thank you so much, Manisha. Thank you so much, Mita. I see some of our friends from our morning class here, so I'm glad you came back. Uh, it's, it's been I will tell you, it's been such a joy and a treat to work with all of the uh, parents and children last five Fridays. We had a great time. Uh, my name is Emily Eisen. Uh, I got my brain cer uh, teacher's certification in the year 2002. Uh, I'm an educational kinesiologist, which means that I use movement to help people learn. Very basic. Dr. Paul Dennison and his wife, Gail Dennison, created the Brain Gym program. It's international, it's in over 90 countries. Uh, I have trained in many, many different areas of the world, 
and now I work with all different people, aging, ranging from one year old all the way up to 101 years old. I work with seniors, I work with elementary school kids, college, work with families, challenge kids, gift too, because gifted kids have problems too. So uh, it, anybody who's got a brain has uh, the raw material to work with and learn and improve and be creative and enjoy their life. And so uh, what I want you to basically know is uh, I first learned this, I was teaching art. I was an art teacher for 34 years. Uh, and then uh, something happened um, in 1995. I, I was diagnosed with a, a benign brain tumor, um, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't cancer. It was just it shouldn't have been there. But the health the <laughs> cells were healthy, and I wanted to learn about my brain. And so there happened to be a brain gym class out here where I live in the United States, Long Island, New York. I took the class. It was twenty four hours called Brain Gym One Hundred and One, and I just noticed over those twenty four hours that. I started to shift. Something happened for me. Uh, I wanted to learn about my brain, but I didn't really know all the other things that were going to happen as a ripple effect. After this course, I went back into the classroom and I started doing the exercises with my students. They happened to be elementary school students uh, from K to sixth grade. Uh, and I started to notice that children who were not focused, when I did the exercises, they could focus. I started to notice that children who were over-focused could let loose a little bit and be creative and move. I started to notice that children who were uh, non-verbal started to express themselves. I started to notice changes in writing. I started to notice changes in speech. Of course, that got me so excited that I wanted to learn more. But there were no brain gym courses being offered in my area. So in order for me to get certified, I had to fly all over the country. And one of my great motivations was that nobody was teaching it where I was. It was like, I need to be the one to bring this here. So I was really inspired and motivated. So I went to different parts of the country. And over the course of a couple of years, I did get my certification. I do want to let you know that in the year 2000, after five years, of uh, some also intervention, complementary medical treatments, I became clear of my, I was on my pituitary gland. I became clear of it. I flew to, North, I flew to California and an uh, expert neurosurgeon invented the method of taking it out of the right nostril called an endoscopy, endoscopy procedure. Flicked it out of my right nostril in three days. I was out of the hospital. I went to California from New York just to go to this doctor. And then, uh, and then I was well. And that was how many years ago? That was uh, in, 19, in the year 2000. So uh, that was 20 years ago. So uh, I made a vow that, you know, help me get well and I'll teach what I learned. That's why I'm a brain gym teacher. So I originally went uh, as a, a patient and then I realized as a teacher, this is amazing. And then I realized as I began to work with the multi-generational population, this is for anybody with a brain. This is not limited. Okay. So that's, that's how I come to be a brain teacher. I work with seniors. I work with children. I work with one-on-one. I, -on -one. I work with kids on the spectrum, cerebral palsy, people with strokes, people with Parkinson's. I also uh, got a grant to work with the Alzheimer's Foundation, uh, lots of senior citizens. Uh, the Alzheimer's Foundation uh, uh, supported me to teach a couple of programs for seniors. So that's how I somebody who uh, is not muted, please mute. There's a little bit of background noise. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, still a little bit of background noise, anybody? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so what do I want you to know before I open the floor up to questions? What I've learned, the most important thing is to be a good observer of myself, but to be a good observer of my students. 
I need to know where are they? What are their challenges? What are their sensory challenges? What are their physical challenges? What are their speech challenges? I need to observe, I need to be with my students and see where they are because that's where I start with. I don't have a goal for them. I need to start from where they are. When I start from where a student is, then I can start to put the pieces together in my mind. What, how I need them with the challenge. So, please, everyone on the call, please mute yourself. Please mute yourself. You're getting too much background. I'll um, if I can mute everybody. Hold on. Yeah, yes, you can. Please, yeah. Yes. please do. Yeah. Settings. Um, da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da Unmute themselves. Share screen. Mute the entry. Okay, it sounds like it's quiet now. Thank you. Um, so there are 26 basic exercises in the Brain Gym program. And the sequence that's important to understand is that if somebody's having a challenge, what we call an imbalanced state, it's not good, it's not bad. It's just that some brain circuits are not turned on. That's what it means. So it takes the judgment out of, it takes the judgment. It takes the, I'm stupid, I can't learn. It takes it out of the picture. When somebody's having a challenge, I go, oh, we need to turn more of your brain circuits on. It's like becomes a science experiment. So in Brain Gym, this sequence, this menu, is where we go from identifying an imbalance, a challenge, we turn, we call that a learning goal, into what is the appropriate set of exercises to help that individual turn on what's not turned on or to lower the energy so that other parts can activate. So it's not always a dormant brain circuitry. It could be an overactive brain circuitry. We either have an over energy or we have an under energy. So that comes into the assessment too. Let's just say there's a situation where more of, of visual tracking is called for. Let's just say that the student is not able to focus. There's going to be certain exercises for that. Let's just say that the student is so over focused, they don't see what's going on around them. There are certain exercises for that. Let's just say a student is what we call homolateral, same sage. There's an exercise for that. There's an exercise to help the student become cross-lateral, activating both hemispheres of the brain. Let's just say a student is very low energy. There's exercises to raise the energy. But let's just say a student is like all over the place. They can't focus. They can't they can't hone in or concentrate. There's exercises to help that student calm and center their energy. So in this sequence of brain gym, where we identify an imbalance, over energy or under energy, we can pull out the exercises to meet that student and address what's going on. These are the steps of a balance. Hold on here. So these, this is a, ba a balance step. So the steps are we identify what's the challenge. Okay, well, what is the learning goal? Where, what is it that we want to result from doing the exercises? And we notice, we become this amazing observer. And we ask our students to observe by saying, what does that feel like? How, how, what can you see? What can't you see? What can you hear? What can't you hear? They might be aware of it. They might not be aware of it. It depends on the age as well. Too. And then we do the exercises and then we see a post activity. We go, what does that feel like now? How does it feel now? Can you throw that ball better now? Wait a minute. Let's see how you're 
writing your name is now. Oh, I can make that letter A now. So we have a post assessment, we see. And then when I have a private student, I say, well, now we know these exercises really help you. This is your learning menu. You get to do this menu five, 10 minutes every day. Pick an exercise in the morning before breakfast. Pick one at lunch, pick one at dinner. If they're in school hours, do a few of them before your homework. I have one a parent who said that when she drove her kids to school, they would be doing the exercises in the back seat. Because there's some that you can do, like, like the thinking cap, activating inner and outer listening. That can be done seated. Even the lazy eight, that can be done seated as well, too. So basically, what I just described to you is a toolkit and how to use the tools and how to assess which tools do I need. How does, does that make sense to you? You understand? Now, some of these are wonderful books that I have um, that really are my brain gym go-tos. I well, first one I read is by Dr. Carla Hannaford called Smart Move. Dr. Carl Hannaford is a neurobiologist, and this has a lot of science-based information. I love this book. It really helped me to understand this is not just moving around. Every movement activates a motor neuron channel, uh, a, a sensory channel. This book is really rich with the science. I love this book by my colleague friend, Kathy Brown, Educate Your Brain. This one is extremely, extremely user-friendly. Kathy Brown, they're both two of my excellent teachers and now that I'm a teacher, they're my colleagues. Uh, this one, of course, was written by Dr. Paul Dennison and his wife, Gail. You don't have to be a teacher to uh, own this book. It's called Brain Gym Teacher's Edition. And this has all every single exercise. And it has what parts of the brain. It has lots of learning menus. Wonderful, wonderful book. So those are my three books. And then I hold a special class. And this is one to tell you about that minister. But I hold a very, very special class called Balancing the Brain. And it's based upon another a book that Dr. Carla Hannaford wrote called The Dominance Factor. This is so essential. I encourage you to have this one, especially this one. Uh, I have a way uh, that I learned to determine all of your preferences, your dominant eye, ear, hand, foot, and hemisphere. And there are 30, 32 different profiles. Each profile has their strengths and has their strengths becoming. He calls it functional and limiting. I changed the words around a little bit. Uh, I'm also a conscious language coach. So I like to use language that keeps feeding, and I don't put word limiting in anything that I do. It's something that's either a strength or it's a strength becoming. And so the child or the student always feels like, I'm not limited, I'm just building a strength. So when I can determine somebody's brain profile, it's very easy to assess. Lots of fun. Uh, I, can, I could say, well, this is why you're having difficulty with this, because the way that you're wired makes these things easy and makes these things a little more challenging. Let's get more of your brain on. We turn more of your brain on, those things that were challenging, they're not going to be as challenging anymore. So I make it fun. If I told my class this morning, if you got anything, anything at all from me, remember my three words, make it fun. To working with children, even big kids like us. If it's fun, it's going to get in there a lot more, right? So basically, I gave you a little overview of how I came to learn Brain Gym, who the uh, creators of it are, some excellent books, the framework of that it's 26 exercises, and there are balanced sequences that we can assess uh, a challenge find a menu, 
notice before, during, and after the exercises and do that pre-activity and that post-activity to see what's it like now to the exercises, what's it like now? And then have a menu to work with so that each day I can build those neural pathways, build that stronger. And then maybe for a while it's like, hey, I'm fine. And then maybe like, wait a minute, I'm having a challenge with this. Then you come and you get another menu and you find out, well, how can I meet myself where I am and get more of my brain power on? So I'm here to answer questions for you. And uh, I'm just going to do one thing now because I'm noticing something needs to be plugged in. So stand by a moment. And you could be thinking of any questions you have for me. I'm ready. I'm ready here. Hang on. So people can either raise hands or uh, and uh, we can unmute them or you can put it into the chat and uh, feel free uh, when you ask a question, come visual yeah. so she can see you. Um, Manisha, I will, I will start it out. That's okay. okay. Yes, yes, sure. So we have Dr. Ram here, Dr. Ram Ramabhadran, one of our uh, board members. And he's the one who helps us to um, with the direction of which programs and what research, everything research question. So Emily, we have Dr. Ram Ramabhadran. Uh, he is one of our board of directors of our foundation. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yes. How can I, how can I help you? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've worked in neurosciences and brain is an amazing thing and you know anything you can find out about it is great and some of the things he showed about the approach the various approach to the brain uh, the pathways you know what is your strong pathway what's your weak pathway that's a great thing that's what we at uh, AAF are also trying to do but one of our goals is to get some objective measurements not subjective measurements that's what we are trying to do with biosensors and such now the question I would ask you, as I would ask anybody who gives such presentation, what's the best case scenario that you have seen in your experience? I am. I'm going to cite two of uh, two of my students, both of whom I started with uh, when they one was three and one was four, and they were both diagnosed as autistic. Before we go to the doctor, she go. Yeah. And what I noticed about them was almost no focus, constantly repeating something that they heard or they learned. There was no, there was no doorway in. Uh, very little focus, really poor coordination, uh, finding comfort and staying with one thing and repeating it again, even if it was self, some self stim. Uh, and I, I worked with those students for years. It wasn't an overnight scenario. Uh, their writing, that writing was not happening. Uh, thinking and expressing was not happening. There was a communication block. Uh, brain gym is, is uh, as much about activating things as it is about removing blocks. And I would just tune in each time with this little three-year-old girl and week after week, week after week, uh, she, she showed improvement slowly and then it started to accelerate. Then there was a corner and I told her parents, I said, hang in because there's gonna come a point where something's gonna click in, I've seen it. And then there's gonna be an acceleration. So we're gonna wait, it's like that waiting for the birth. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so how old are they now? And uh, Chelsea is now, uh, she's graduated from college. She had a full scholarship. And I will tell you, I love to sing. And I would sing with her all the time because I noticed that's when she paid attention. She would hear a song once, she would memorize the song. And if I wanted to open up a doorway to her learning, I would sing to her. And do you know she got a full scholarship for vocal training and is now a singer. 
she is she is performing and um, I am just noticing here that I am plugged in to be charged. I'm very sorry, but I don't see the charge going up. So just give me one moment to get this happening in a different way. Stand by. I will be taught three classes this morning. And so the uh, charge, stand by. I'll keep talking while I'm, I'm doing this. So, um, so that was one. That was one. That was Chelsea. And uh, she sends me her YouTubes all the time. She's doing acting. She's, she's, she's communicating beautifully. Uh, her speech is clear. It's just phenomenal. So that's one case. Uh, another case is uh, a little boy who I'm still working with, and I've been working with him now since he's four, little Henry. Henry now can actually, he's eight now. Henry now and I Zoom together, and he follows every direction. Also on the autism schedule, uh, um, the, the scale, and he also, a lot of similar things, Chelsea, bright as can be, so sharp and so bright, but tuned out, like happy and bright in his own little world. And it's like, okay, let's get, let's get this connection going on. So certain things were connected in here, but he wasn't able to make this connection. And so, uh, so Henry is another one now, and I'm still working with him. And because I've been working with him so many years, I've taken a lot of the brain gym exercises and I have come up with some new variations because he needs new stuff now. <laughs> he needs the new thing. So I would say Chelsea, Chelsea and Henry are two excellent, excellent cases. And I also want to throw in while we're at it that I've been teaching uh, the senior citizen community in my town now for 16 years. And they're on a locked unit. Uh, they're smart. They're sharp. They just can't be alone all day. So they go all day to this program called the Senior Daycare. They're all in, they're intelligent people. They've held fantastic jobs. They're smart. I love interacting with them. And sometimes I come in and it's like everybody is like wilted. And after that hour, just one hour, like we have on Friday mornings, Manisha, after one hour, there's eye contact. Some of them in the beginning, they haven't spoken to anybody. They, didn't, they forgot they have a voice. They're communicative. Their voice is clear. They're articulating. They're asking questions. It's kind of miraculous. So we're talking about the young children on the spectrum. We're talking about the senior citizens on the other end of the generational uh, learning uh, curve. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Amy, um, Emily, are you going to see the question in the chat? Uh, people, uh, one of the question is uh, how? Please discuss about some brain gym which can help in speech and language development. Okay. Um, wow, there's so many fabulous exercises for speech and language. What I learned is we can speak what we can hear. So when I, you know, before I even think about articulation, I'm going to assess what hearing. Because you know from the early, early years, even before words, it's the, the infant is listening to the mother, the cooing, the tone, the softness, even before any uh, speech formation happens. It's the first thing I'm going to assess. What are you hearing? Okay? Because there's what we call mirror neurons. Even though mirror is visual, there's also resonance neurons. What I can hear. I can speak. I can't hear it. I'm not going to speak it. So uh, that makes a, you know, a lot of sense. I need to know. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to 
find out from that student what are they hearing. I might even go into another room. I might whisper in one ear. I might whisper in the other ear. I might ask them to uh, play copy me, my turn, your turn. I might say, hi ho, and then your turn. And if that child can't do it, I know they're not hearing me. Okay, so before I do any speech, I like to turn on the hearing. And one of the exercises I do for that is called the thinking tap. We could all do it together, all right? The thinking tap is where we turn on inner listening and outer listening, okay? Because we all know that whether we're aware of it or not, we're speaking into ourselves all the time, right? Like right now, I'm telling you something, you just translated what I told you to tell yourself that. So that system of communication is going on inside and outside as well. Take your thumbs, put them up. Take your fingers, make two birdies. I want to see you doing this because this is, this is experiential. So everybody bird beak. Bird beak. I know from my yoga training, that the most effective way to learn is from direct experience. My thumbs are gonna go inside the curl of my ear. My index is on the outside. I do it at the it's same time. Okay. Bird beak. I take it right in and the, my index finger goes on the outside of the curl. There's over 300 acupressure points on the rim of my ear. And I go very slow. I uncurl it. I uncurl. I uncurl, uncurl, uncurl. Is it sore or tender? Just do a little bit. Uncurl. Come all the way down to the earlobe. The earlobe in acupuncture is the head. The top of the ear is the feet. The bottom of the ear is the head. So I take it. I get a nice tall posture. Keep the spine long so you can conduct energy channels. I relax the jaw. I take some nice deep breaths and I uncurl. Uncurl, 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 uncurl. I don't miss a spot, and then I hold it. One, two, three. I do that three times. So it turns on inner and outer listening. And then I will interact with my students to see, how are you hearing me now? What are you, what are you getting now? What are you listening to now? Uh, other exercises for speech, believe it or not, uh, Carla Hannaford was working in a, a, a jail one time, and she noticed that a lot of the inmates were nonverbal. She noticed that there was not a lot of speech going on. And what she came to understand is that when somebody is in a stress or a survival state, there's a certain reflex called the TGR, tendon guard reflex. And if that reflex is on and it tightens, it tightens the back of the calf, the back of the thigh, the back and the neck, preparing the body for fight or flight. Language is shut off at that point. That system is in survival. She noticed that from doing the calf pump, we just did the calf pump this morning, lengthens the tendon guard reflex. And when that reflex is released, it gives a message to the brain, you're not in danger. She noticed that when she did the calf pump with them, that they started to have more language available to them. So that is a, another exercise. You would think like, what does that have to do with it? You know, lengthening the, the muscles in the back of your leg, but that has a lot to do with it because learning is so tied into feeling safe so that we can give our attention to what we're learning. That if we don't feel safe or our system's in a stress state, our eyes, first of all, are not gonna focus. We're gonna be watching out in the periphery. And the teacher goes, look at me when I'm talking to you. The child doesn't feel safe. They're watching out to make sure that nothing hurts them. So a child, a person, an adult, has to be in a state where they feel safe to take information in. So that's one of the exercises, uh, and it's called a lengthening exercise. Of course, there's the other exercise where we want to actually relax the jaw, and that's the energy yarn, where we want to make the apparatus of speech 
able to function. The armature uh, and the jaw position, the tongue position, we want to work with the actual anatomy of that too and relaxing the jaw. The jaw holds 90% attention. So a lot of times, I'll, one of the first things I'll do after we drink water and we oxygenate, relax the jaw. You'll notice I always start the class with an energy on. Because when your jaw is relaxed, you can, you can learn better. So the next question is about calming the, down, the child down. Um, what, are the, um, what are the exercises they can help to calm and with their attention? Uh, how old is the child we're talking about? Uh, I don't know the age, um, but okay, yeah. it's just gonna. Uh, it. He's six years old. Six. Okay. Uh, well, if a six-year-old child, and I do this even with my two-year-old grandson, uh, if if there's any upset or uh, unrest going, uh, I might go on to their back and do a lazy eight. You see the lazy eight over here? It's an infinity sign. I might just go on their back, give them some water. Water's first, always water, always water first. Sip of water, see if their electricity is on. Their electricity is not on, doesn't matter what you do with anybody. It's not just if you're hot or sweating, but if you don't have enough water in your brain, it can't conduct those signals it needs to. You understand, water first, always. Then I might come behind the child and just put my hand there and just do some lazy eight on the back. Go up to the left first and then around through the middle. Lazy eights are great for that. Then if the child calms down, I might just say, let's be elephants. Let's do the lazy eight elephants. And maybe we'll make lazy eights together and I'll hold their hand. So pretend that your hand is here and I'm holding it. And I'm gonna go, oh, we're gonna go up, around and down really slow. Then I'm gonna ask them, hey, let's bend our knees. They're gonna come down, starting to get the whole body involved in it. So I might have them do lazy eights. Lazy eights also help the left and the right brain switch on to work together. You know, when anybody's in stress, whether it's a young child or an adult, we're gonna go to our dominance. I told you before the dominance factor with Dr. Carla Hannaford, right? We're gonna go to our dominance and the non-dominant is gonna switch off. So now we're working with just some of the circuits on. So the lazy eight turns on the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and you do it rhythmically. And then the movement starts to happen. Now, let's say the child doesn't wanna do moving. Let's say they're like, they're calming down when you're making lazy eights on the back. Well, you succeeded. You don't have to do anything more. Always ask, hey, I just did some lazy eights on your back. You want to do it together? Find out, ask, and then make it fun. So lazy eights is my go-to. I even remember one time I was in school teaching and one of the pre-K kids got stung by a bee. Uh, and one of the pre-K kids got stung by a bee. Nobody could calm the child down. And I went, brought a cup of water over, and then I started making lazy eights on the child's back. Guess what? That child started to breathe normally and calm down. So the next question is on the short-term memory or the memory. Um, my son, is, uh, he gets confused if we teach multiple things. Uh, if I teach apple, he will show it correctly. But once I teach another fruit, he will forget the previous and get confused. Which brain activity can help to avoid confusion and memory? Well, I'll tell you that. You're, it's a great question. Uh, Kim and Dr. Uh, Shivani uh, Gidhar and Navita, can you please mute yourself? Kim, can you please mute yourself? Dr. Shivani, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Namabita, can you please mute yourself? Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. So this is a really good question, and there's more to it than meets the ear and the eye. Uh, 
the first thing that I would do with your son is I would do a profile. I'm going to find out that what channel is not getting the brain power. So let's just take an example here. Uh, and of course, I don't have your son's profile, so I can't say. But I'm going to show you what is called a domino. And I'm going to give you an example based upon information I would find out. So this is a domino here. It's just the left and the right hemisphere of the brain, not the whole brain. All right. So now this is the right side. For me, if I'm looking behind it, left and right. Let's just say on this profile, let's just say there's a dominant right ear and a dominant left ear, a dominant right ear, I'll show you in a moment, and a dominant right hemisphere. Since you're just talking about memory right now, I'm going to do the whole thing. Let's just say there's dominant left hand and a dominant left leg. There's 32 different profiles. None are right, none are wrong. Let's see this profile. Okay. If I did his profile and I found out that he was right ear dominant, uh, no, I'm going to switch this. Hold on a second. Left ear dominant. Let's switch it around here. If I found out that he was left ear dominant, I'm making this in blue, so just follow the blue, never mind the orange. If I found out that he was left, uh, left ear dominant, left eye dominant, now, you know how the brain works? It works like this. So the right, this left hemisphere only powers what's on the other side. The right hemisphere powers what's on the left side, left hemisphere. If I found out that he was left eye and left ear dominant, I would know that when that information is coming in, what he sees or what he hears, it's going to the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is not the language hemisphere. Do you understand? So his language, there could be a slight delay in it, which interrupts integrating learning something new. So if I found out that he was left ear dominant, I would know there might be a slight auditory delay. It's going to the right hemisphere. It's got to cross over again to get back to the left hemisphere. There's a slight delay in that. Same thing with the visual, left hemisphere visual, um, and, it's, and it's powered only on the same side. It's not getting the juice. So there's a lot of information that I would need to find out. But generally, I could say in terms of memory, there is a menu for memory. One of the things for memory, two of the exercises I do with people, if I haven't assessed them, is also the thinking cap. That's one we just did. And the other one is the it's called the hookups and I call on the exons if you want to all do it with me now we have a few minutes left it's a really good way to end our, our Q&A webinar here um, uh, you want to take your right leg and cross it over your left you want to take your right hand cross it over your right you want to hold your own hand put it on your navel right up the central meridian relax your shoulders and your jaw and this is called the it's called the hookups. I call it the exons. Our whole body circuitry now is energizing into ourself. And I'm going to do what I call candle rose breathing. So I breathe through my nose and I smell the roses. And then I blow out the candles. Now, when I'm working with a student while they're doing their exons, this is what I do with their head because my hands are available. I put one hand on their occiput, and I put my other hand, thumb in middle, one inch above their eyebrow onto what we call the positive point. Positive points send blood up to the cerebral cortex. I hold it very gently. 
you can even ask the person, does that feel okay? And I hold that point and I bring blood up to my cerebral cortex while they're in their exons and they're breathing and their eyes are closed and I'm holding their occiput and I'm holding what's called a frontal eminence that activates the brain to relax and the memory can connect. And those are some brain gym exercises. I also teach something called language of mastery and I teach people to talk to their brain so their brain can understand. This is not brain gym. I learned this at the same time I learned brain gym because I wanted to learn about my brain. And I learned that my brain is always listening for my directions. And it only understands directions that are very clear, very specific, and also connected to my feelings. And so I will say, if somebody says to me, I don't remember, I will activate their brain and say, do you choose to remember? Most of the time they'll say, what? Because I'm entering the system of their brain that they just told not to remember. I'm talking into their brain. Do you choose to remember? Well, obviously they're gonna say yes. And they say yes. And then I say, what do you choose to remember? I'm telling you nine times out of 10, they know it, but they told themselves they don't remember. Do you understand that? So I say, do you choose to remember? Yes, I choose to remember. What do you choose to remember? I don't know. I go, again, I'll enter and I'll start a new language system. I'll go, do you choose to know? Now they go, what? Because I'm interrupting a pattern of helplessness, of I don't know. I go, do you choose to know? They go, yes, I choose to know. I go, what do you choose to know? Constantly tapping into areas that they've closed down into learned helplessness. Do you understand? So I will have a conversation with a person. I will ask them, can I, can, do you choose to know? Do you choose to remember? switches their system on. That old pattern switched on to a new pattern. I could take one more question before we close our webinar so, today. Uh, the question is, um, how, how often can they do uh, the brain gym in, in a day? How often can they, de can they do the brain gym exercises in a day? What I recommend is start the day with the pace, getting in pace. That's drinking water, turning on your brain button. Those of you that have come to class, you know what I'm talking about. Doing the cross crawl and then doing the Epsom. You all had an experience of either doing that or watching that. So everybody gets in pace. That's the way you start the day. The rest of the day, I call it responsive brain gym. During the day, I'm like, I'm kind of fuzzy, I'm foggy, I'm not thinking clearly, then I'm gonna do an exercise that I meet myself so I can help my brain. If I'm experiencing like overwhelm, over energy, I'm gonna do an exercise. So during the day, I meet myself responsibly by noticing what's going on for me, what do I need to be balanced? So the brain gym can be done throughout the day, even sometimes if I wanna really settle into a nice deep sleep, I'll be laying in bed, I'll do my exons in bed, I'll lay down, I'll do my candle rose breathing, send myself on to a really nice, deep, sweet sleep. So there's brain gym to start the day, there's brain gym to meet yourself during the day, and there's brain gym to end your day. So Emily, thank you very much. This was a very wonderful session. Um, I know there is one more question which is unanswered. I'll be happy to email you that. Um, uh, so I want to tell you everybody that uh, Emily, we will be conducting this online brain gym classes every Friday. We just finished our first batch. 
Second batch will start July 3rd. Discounted rating for parents in India. Please connect with me or Meeta and Emily will be teaching all these exercises. Uh, so Emily, what I understand from you, it's very important to uh, understand and educate about the dominance factor of the brain and the parent should know or the educator should know how to profile the child and when you talk about the menu there are exercises which can be customized and all this can a parent or a professional can learn uh, through a six hours of training which we are putting uh, uh, which we are putting so all the information will be sent to you uh, emily last question uh